Good morning, church. Are you excited to be in church this morning? Are you thankful to be able to walk into a building and freely gather and worship God this morning? Amen. I'm so glad that you are here this morning. We're going to jump right into it this morning. We're beginning a new series called Selfless. Turn to your neighbor and say selfless. A new series called Selfless. And really this idea of being selfless is this. It's putting other people's wants and needs above my own. It's, it's what do they want, what do they need, and choosing that first over choosing what I want and what I need. And I wanna ask you a question this morning. Do you live a selfless life? Some of you say, well, of course I live a selfless life. I'm a parent. That's being a very selfless person. Or I am married. Of course I live a selfless life. But I wanna ask you, are you selfless to every person around you? Every person that you encounter, are you putting their needs, their wants above your own? You know, I wanna brag on, on one of our students for a minute. I, lots of times, teenagers, uh, they get this bad rap that they are very selfish, right? Teenagers, oh, they're so selfish, all they care about is themselves. What I've found working with teenagers and working with adults is that being selfish, it isn't really a teenager problem, it's a, a person problem. Like it's everybody. Everybody has struggles with being selfish. And I found uh, a few weeks ago, one of our students, an eighth grade boy, going around after service got done and picking up all the garbage. Every Wednesday night we do notes and there are these half sheets and there's little golf pencils. And he was going around picking up all the golf pencils, picking up all the garbage, all the extra notes, cleaning both rooms. And then when students would leave, would go down into our game room and clean that up and reset that whole space. Some of you are going, man, I can't even get my teenager to clean their own room from their own mess. And this kid, middle school boy, is cleaning up other people's. How amazing is that? But then I found... One of his siblings said, hey, you need to ask him what happened at a live conference. So I said, hey, what happened at a live conference? And kind of reluctantly, he told me this. Well, after service on Friday night, I, I went into the go to the bathroom, and there were some kids in there laughing, and I kind of went over to see what they were laughing at, and I found that they took confetti that was shot off during service, and they stuffed it into the urinal. And he said, he asked them, did you guys do this? And they say, he said, they kind of laughed and told, him, and told me no, but I knew they were lying to me. I knew they were lying. So he said after he went to the bathroom, he went to the concessions where he then saw them again, went to our concessions team and asked for some pairs of gloves, took those gloves, handed them to the kids and said, come on, let's go clean up your mess. How amazing is that? That is being selfless. How many adults, how many people would look at that and say, ah, not my fault, not my problem. I didn't cause it, therefore I don't have to solve it. But can I tell you that just because it's not your fault doesn't mean it's not your problem, and we are called to be selfless and serve whatever way possible. And I love that this eighth grade boy recognizes the power in serving the house of the Lord. And there are some people in here, and, and I wanna just recognize, man, thank you for serving at New Hope. Thank you for being a part jumping in for early childhood, for our youth teams, wherever that is that you serve, you are what makes this possible. But I wanna encourage some here, if you are not serving, get plugged in and serve. It is a very selfless thing to do. And what you'll find is that when you are selfless, you will find that you will have joy. There's joy that comes from being selfless in whatever area you have. Maybe you say, I am struggling to find joy in this area. I'm encouraging you, be selfless in that area. You know, I found lots of times an area that people don't have a ton of joy in is in finances, right? Like, oh, I, I want more money, I need more money, I could always have more of this, and it's always kind of this, this thing that maybe you don't have a ton of joy. Well, can I tell you this morning, the time that I've had the most joy in my finances is not when my savings accounts the most, it's not on payday, but it's when I give my money. It's when I'm selfless and I, I sacrifice and I give my money up. And you know what I've found? There's been lots of times I've purchased things, I've bought things that I thought were cool, that I thought were gonna make me happy, and I've regretted buying those things. But one thing I've never regretted is giving my money to God. It's never been a regret and it's always the best investment. It's always reaching lost people. All my money here, 
anything I can buy at the store, it's going to break and it's going to be out of date at some point. But you know what's never going to be out of date? Salvation, souls, giving money to missionaries so that they can go and tell people about Jesus so they can spend eternity in heaven. And I want to encourage you this morning, if you're having a hard time finding joy in your finances, give generously. Give your money. We're, we're commanded by God to give our tithe. That's the first 10%, our first fruit. So that means every $10 you get, you're commanded to give a dollar for every $10. We're commanded to do that. And what I found is lots of times people say, well, I need to give 10%, but I'm going to give it to this area and give it to this area. That's offerings, where we choose where it goes. Our tithe, it goes to God. And what happens is when you are not giving your tithe, or where you're putting your tithe other places, is you're not just robbing from God, which should be scary enough, but what you'll find is that you're robbing from yourself. When we do not give our tithe, we're robbing from ourselves because there's a blessing that comes from your obedience. And God's commanded us to give. And then above and beyond, we sacrificially give. We give to missions. We give to the building project. We give to whatever that is. And Pastor Weaver sent a text this week to me, and I said, this is perfect. And it's this, sacrificial giving is the antidote to selfish living. Sacrificial giving is the antidote to selfish living. If you're having a hard time not being selfish, sacrificially give. And what you'll find is that as you are selfless and as you give, you find that you will have joy. Isn't that crazy that in order for me to get something, I have to make it not about me. We live a life that is selfless. And this morning, we're kicking off this new series that'll be today and the next two weeks titled Selfless. And we're just going to be going through John chapter 17. So if you have your Bible, you can turn to John chapter 17. But we're, we're breaking this chapter down. And what we see in John 17 is this is the Lord's Prayer. And my, maybe not the Lord's Prayer that you're thinking of, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That is how Jesus told them how they should pray. This is Jesus praying. And what we see is this is a very holy passage. We know the whole Bible, right, the inspired word of God, it's holy. It's, it's, it's a holy book. But this chapter, as I was preparing and as I was reading this week, I found what a holy chapter this is. That God, right, God the Son speaking to God the Father. God talking to God, preparing to go to the cross in your place and in my place. It's very holy of a, of a script here. And if you would just join me in, in just standing out of reverence for this passage as we read the word of God together, we're just reading John 17, starting in verse one, going to verse five. It says, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Now we thank you for your word, your inspired word. We thank you for this text that we have of, of Jesus speaking to you, God. And, and I pray that right now that you would just begin to speak to us, that you would begin to call us to live a selfless life. I pray you'd speak through me and that we would be open to you this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So John 17, Jesus speaking to God he starts off saying this, after Jesus said this, after he said this, and I started wondering, well, what was it that he said? And as we look at John chapter 17, we can really go all the way back to John chapter 13, where we see the Passover meals happening. For 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and then we go into 18, where Jesus walks into the garden before he gets arrested. This is all happening during that Passover meal. Now, it's crazy to me to think that that means in John chapters 1 through 12, we have 33 years of Jesus' life. And obviously, we know that there's other gospels that cover other stories. But in, if only 12 chapters cover 33 years, how many stories, how many teachings of Jesus do we not even know of? I can't wait till someday we can get to heaven and we can just watch the tape back. We can watch what Jesus did every single day when he was here on earth. But for 33 years and 12 chapters, and then for one Passover 
in five chapters. That tells me that what happened in these five chapters from 13 to 17 are some pretty important things that Jesus said that Jesus did during this time. So we go all the way back to 13. 13, we see Jesus, he washes the feet of his disciples. He's serving them, right? He's, he's being very, what do you know, even Jesus was selfless. He's serving them, and as he's preparing to go to the cross, it's, it's a foreshadowing there. And then he predicts the betrayal, and he predicts the denial. That happens in 13. In chapter 14, we see he comforts his disciples. How does he comfort them? By promising them the Holy Spirit. Church, do you know this morning that you have access to the Holy Spirit? You have access to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has amazing things for your life. And what we see is, is the Holy Spirit, it's not just someone who we read about in the Bible, but it's someone who is for today. And maybe you've been in a church experience before and you're weirded out by the Holy Spirit. You're like, man, I don't really want to talk about that, mess with that, like that's where people just like push each other down, and I'm telling you that's been a, a wrong way that people have presented it to you, all right? That's weird. The Holy Spirit's not weird. People are weird, amen, <laughs> right? People are weird. Holy Spirit's not, but, and maybe you've heard that it's not for today, but it is for today. It's not weird. What we see is that the Holy Spirit is a person. You go all the way back to Genesis. God said, let us Make mankind in our image. That's God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And because Holy Spirit is a person, that means you can have a personal relationship with him. And it's an everyday sort of a thing. It's not this like all oh, this goosebumps I have to have sort of thing. It's an everyday thing that you can have with the Holy Spirit. And he has amazing gifts for you. And what I love is all the gifts from the Holy Spirit are not just gifts to you. They're gifts to you for other people. God wants to give a gift to you so he can give it through you. They're to you for others. And, and Jesus is here with the disciples. And can you just imagine for a moment being with Jesus in the flesh? Being a follower of Jesus. And you have Jesus right there all the time. You have a headache, Jesus can heal it. Poof, right? You have something going on, Jesus is right there. You're telling someone about Jesus, right? Anybody ever had a hard time telling someone about Jesus? Like, well, Jesus, and he's not here on earth, he's alive in heaven, right? No, Jesus is right there. Like, have you heard about Jesus? Here he is, right? Right there. It would be amazing to have Jesus in the flesh. But what he says is, it's better that I go. It's better that I leave so I can send the Holy Spirit, which tells me this, that Holy Spirit in you is even better than Jesus right beside you. And you have access to him every single day. And I'm telling you that if you are not accessing the Holy Spirit, if you are not setting yourself up into a position to receive from him and to be moved by him and to be led by him, then you are missing it because there's amazing things he has for you. Amazing things. Holy Spirit in you, it's even better than Jesus besides you. And Jesus said, you're gonna do even greater things than I did. You have access to the Holy Spirit. So that happens in 14. In chapter 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He says, stay connected to the vine, which tells me this, that it's not a once you're in the vine, you're always in the vine sort of a deal. It's not a once you're saved, always saved sort of deal, but we have to stay connected to the vine. We need to stay connected to God. And you know what being connected to God doesn't look like? It doesn't just look like I'm gonna show up to church once a week and that's my relationship with Christ. Can you imagine for a moment if my relationship with my wife, if it looked like this, I'm gone all week, I show up for an hour and a half, and I sing a song about her, someone tells me about her, and then I ask her for stuff, and then I leave. And then maybe I send her a couple texts throughout the week, like, hey, can you do this? Hey, I need this. Hey, can you help me with this? And that's the extent of our relationship. How many would you know I'm probably not gonna stay married for long if that's my relationship with my wife? That's very unhealthy. But how often is that how we treat God? I show up to church, check that box. I pray and really our prayer is like, God do this, God I need this, God help me with this, and that's it. Man, you need to stay connected to the vine, a constant relationship with God. And a relationship doesn't just like, look like me talking to God, it looks like me listening to God. I wanna encourage you, church, be in your word. Be reading your word. Be in prayer. Be listening to what God's speaking to you. Parents in the room, I wanna encourage you, be reading your word in front of your kids. 
Be reading your word with your kids. Let your kids see you reading your Bible. Let your kids see you writing down what God's speaking to you. Let them see that that should be a thing that encourages them. That should be a, an example that they want to live their life like that. Don't just count on myself and Pastor August and Pastor Luke and Courtney and Anna to do all the spiritual leading for your child. Most of your kids, if you have a middle school or high school, I have them for an hour and a half a week. And if you send them to Sunday school, which I want to encourage you to, we're going through the whole Bible. A couple weeks ago, we talked about Leviticus. All right? We talked about all these sorts of books. There was, there was a kid in, in youth Sunday school when we said, we're going to talk about Leviticus. And they said, is that a book in the Bible? And I say, well, Pastor Zach, you're doing a poor job. I would say, parents, come on. Let's show our kids what it's like to go after God, to be connected to the vine. So we see he talks about being connected to the vine, and then in 16 he talks more about the Holy Spirit, and he wraps up 16 talking about having joy. Turn to your neighbor and say joy. Joy. He talks, your grief, it's going to be turned to joy. I'm going to be gone, but don't worry. I'm going to come back. The whole world's going to rejoice while you mourn, but don't worry. Your grief, it's going to be turned to joy. And I love that this ends talking about joy right before we get to a point of praying a selfless prayer. Because living a selfless life leads to living a joy-filled life. This year at New Hope, we're talking about having a culture of joy. How do we have joy? It's by putting Jesus first, others second, and you last. J-O-Y. It's being selfless. We live in a world right now where it seems like everybody's angry and upset by everything all the time, right? You know what I'm talking about? Like you pull up social media and there's always an argument happening. I can't post anything to social media without praying for 35 minutes that it's not going to offend someone, right? Everyone's upset by everything all the time. Let's be a church that has joy. How do we have it? By putting Jesus first, then serving others and myself last. It's by being selfless that we have joy. So Jesus, he, he walks through all of these things, and then we get to chapter 17. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. We see in these five verses, Jesus says glory or glorify five times. Glory or glorify five times. What does it mean to glorify God? It's to give him all of the honor and all of the praise. You know why? Because God deserves it. It's giving him the honor. It's giving him the praise. And we see Jesus praying here, and he's basically praying this, that your will be done. Right? We see the actual what's labeled as the Lord's Prayer. Right? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, like we're submitting to the will of God. And that's what Jesus is doing here is he's submitting to God saying, God, whatever it is you want, I will do that. I want to encourage you that our prayer life should be, a li should be a prayer life of submitting to God. God, what is it that you want from me? God, what is it that you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? I think lots of times people's prayer life, it looks like ordering from Burger King. Like, hey, can I have a, a Whopper? No lettuce, no ketchup, extra pickles on the side, right? Like you have this whole order, you get up there, they mess up your order, and then you can complain about it and tell them what they did wrong. Lots of people view God that way, that I can tell God this is what I want and this is how I want it, and when it doesn't happen, then I have the right to be mad at God. But can I tell you that when you are praying, you're not praying by ordering at Burger King, but you're praying to the King of Kings? And it's not about what you want. It's saying, God, whatever it is that you want, I submit to your will. God, I think this is what I want right now, but I know that you see the big picture and you know what's ahead, so I submit to what you want. We submit to God. Then continue in verse two, for you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. We're talking about eternity. And Jesus didn't come just to open up the door to say, all right, now eternity's open for everybody. But he came to open up eternity so that we could have a relationship with God through Jesus. That through Jesus dying on the cross, we can have a relationship with God, spend eternity in heaven with him. I want you to know this this morning, that everyone spends forever somewhere. Everyone's spending forever somewhere. And if you believe that heaven is real, you have to believe that hell is real. You can't just look and say, oh, this is good, but this seems like, nah, that doesn't seem real. So I'm just not going to believe that part of the Bible. If the heaven is real, hell is real. 
and we need to live in light of eternity. That should give us a sense of urgency for me reaching lost people, that everyone I encounter is spending eternity somewhere. In youth right now, we're talking about this. No one else is coming. That we need to live our life going to school, going to work, talking to my family, walking through my neighborhood with this mindset that I may be the only person that ever tells this person about Jesus. No one else is coming. And when we live with that mindset that no one else is coming because I know they might spend eternity in hell, that gives us a sense of urgency to say, man, listen to this guy named Jesus, what he did for you. We live with this sense of urgency because eternity is for everybody and it's forever. Everyone spends forever somewhere, heaven or hell. And Jesus opened up that so that we could have a relationship with God through him. And then he wraps this up with saying, I've brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Man, maybe you're in here this morning and you're great at your job. Maybe you're an amazing mother, an amazing father. You take pride in being, I'm a a hard worker. I wanna ask you, who gets the glory in what you do? Is it yourself or is it God? Because we see even Jesus, even Jesus, every miracle he did, people saw it and they worshiped God in heaven. He says, I have finished the work you gave me to do. Notice he didn't say, I started the work you gave me to do. I thought about the work you gave me to do. I finished the work. How many times do we come into church? God speaks to us, I want you to do this. And we leave and we never finish it, let alone even start it. Maybe there's someone here and a long time ago, God spoke something to you. Maybe you were a kid, a teenager at camp and God spoke something to you and you know this is what God called me to do and you have not finished the work. Jesus says, I finished the work you gave me to do. I don't know about you, but someday I wanna get to heaven and I want my report to God to be, I finished what you gave me to do. Not, I thought about it. Well, I have this excuse for why I didn't get to it. I started it. No, I finished the work you gave me to do. I was obedient, I did what you called me to do. We see, because Jesus finished the work that his Father, that that God the Father gave him to do, Jesus gets all the glory so that God can get all the glory. So I wonder, how how does this work? How does this work that Jesus gets all the glory so that God can get all the glory? And I thought to illustrate it this way. Uh, Jake, can you help me? Come on up, come on up. Come on, give it up for Jake. My man, come on up here, come on up here. What's your name? I'm Jake. One for one, got it down. How old are you? 24. Single? Taken. Taken, sorry ladies. What, what's some hobbies you got? Uh, I like coin collecting, so I do some silver, do some stock trading, uh, do a lot of taxes. Your hobby is taxes. Praise God. (laughs) I'm so flabbergasted but that you just said that. So let's say Jake, being as awesome as he is, doing taxes, right? He, he's going from one tax spot to the next because he's like, hey, I love doing taxes. I'm gonna go to everyone's house and do the taxes. You're like Zacchaeus, but reverse. (laughs) This is amazing. But you're going, you're like, I'm, I'm here doing taxes, I'm there doing taxes. And because you're taken on your way to the next tax spot, doing your hobby, you get a text from your lady and you're like, oh, I love my lady. What did she have to say? You pull your phone out. And as you're looking at your phone, you're driving down the road, someone walks out and let's say you hit them and you killed them. I was like, wow, that just got really dark really fast. So you just made a mistake, and I know you never make mistakes. Never make mistakes, so this is hypothetical. But you're driving down, pull out your phone, make the mistake of looking at it, someone walks out, you hit them, and you kill them. And now you have to pay the punishment for this. 
you have a price that you have to pay. You killed someone, and really, your life, you killed someone, so now it's your life. Life for life, right? Blood for blood. So let's say because of that, now you are punished, and now you are in prison. Go ahead and put your hands out. Wrapped up in prison, and now he needs to give his life. You killed someone. It was an accident. It was a mistake, but you can't take it back. You did it, you pay the price. So because you're there, you're wrapped up and there was bloodshed, now I am gonna shed your blood, right? You paid, you have to pay this price and you have to die. And let's say I'm looking at you and I know this was a mistake, I know it was an accident, but it doesn't change the reality that you still have to pay the price. And I love Jake, Jake's awesome, he's amazing great guy and I look at him and I love him I think man that's a big price you have to pay but then I look over and then there's my son Barrett Barrett can you come on up here come on up bud my man Barrett can you say hi to everybody hi Hi. how old are you four. four years old this is Barrett he's my oldest son four years old Barrett is in his first year of preschool, knows his numbers, got a report card, knows his shapes, working on his letters, doing awesome. Played soccer, playing baseball this year, praise God that he's playing baseball. Doing swimming lessons, all that fun stuff. Barrett's the oldest, Barrett's, he's a big helper. We have two other boys, little boys, always getting the passy always getting a blanket, always always helping out, holding his brother's hand as he crosses the street. And I, and I love Barrett. You know I love you? Yeah, I love Barrett. And I look at Jake, and Jake made a mistake. And Jake's punishment is that he needs to die. He killed someone, he needs to die. And I look at Jake and I say, man, but I love Jake. I care about Jake. And seeing Jake, that he made a mistake, someone has to pay the price. Instead of making Jake pay the price, let's say that I took Barrett, and I took Barrett and I put him in Jake's position. Now Jake is free. And now Barrett has to pay the price. Barrett did nothing to deserve your punishment. But I looked at you and I said, I love you. So I give you my son. And now because I give my son and I let Barrett die in the place of Jake, now Barrett gets the glory because he took your spot. And me as the father, I just gave up my son for him. And because I told my son to take his spot, because I gave him up, I get the glory. Barrett gets the glory and I get the glory. He didn't deserve it. He deserves all the praise. He, he, he didn't make that mistake. Church, do you understand this morning that there's a God in heaven who looked at you, you made a mistake, the price of sin is death, and really what you deserve is you deserve to die. But God looked at you, he said, I love you, I care about you, I'm not willing to condemn you without giving you the opportunity to receive salvation. So he gave up his son, his perfect, his spotless son to take your place. And because God gave up Jesus because Jesus left heaven coming to earth dying for you that means he gets all the praise and God gets all the praise he gets all the glory and God gets all the glory so can you just stand with me for one moment all across this room and can we just begin to worship God who deserves all the praise all the glory all the honor right now before we go any further just begin to worship him right now church begin to praise him church here's my my final call to us this morning. What a selfless act that Jesus left his place, came to earth and died for us. And because Jesus lives selflessly, that means that's how we need to live. I need to live a selfless life. I need to live a life that surrenders to God, surrenders to others, and I put my own needs and my own wants last. So this morning as we just 
get ready to close. Can we just have a moment where if that's you this morning, you say, man, I want to live a life that is selfless. I want to surrender to God and say, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, I surrender to you. Because of the sacrifice that you made, I now sacrifice my life in return. And if you want to live a life, say, I want to live selflessly. I invite you just to come forward as an outward expression of an inward decision, saying, I'm giving my life. I'm living selflessly this morning. If you need prayer for something, you can come right on over here. We'll pray for you. But let's just have a moment where we continue to worship God, where we continue to respond and say, God, I give you my life. Come on, church. I tell you, I can't even imagine as a father giving my child in place of someone else. This is my grandson that was standing up here, taking that tax guy's place. And I love you, Jake, but it'd be hard for me to give my son or my grandson for you. That's just me being human. But I'm so thankful for the love of God to give his son in my place and in your place, to take the penalty for us so that we can know real life. I'm reminded of what Paul said in Romans chapter 12 when he said, I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer yourselves a living sacrifice, one that is holy and pleasing and honorable to God. This is your spiritual worship. When you consider everything that God has done for you, is it too much to ask to live a selfless life? Is it too much to ask to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sacrifice what I want to do what he wants. I'm going to sacrifice what I desire to help somebody else. I'm thankful for a church that really is selfless. So many of you serve, and you serve in different areas. We had a... a a gentleman that was in the eight o'clock service who has become a youth leader. He's my age. And he's been serving with the youth for a year, giving and serving and helping. And he's an incredible youth leader. And we need probably 50 more youth leaders. We have a great team, but there's never a limit to what we can do. Children's workers, early childhood. There are hundreds of people that serve in early childhood every month. But tonight we have a kid's camp, kids choir camp that's going to happen every Sunday night through May and then they're going to present a concert to us. We've got over a hundred kids who are part of this camp. And so families are going to be bringing their children and some of them have younger children and guess where they're going to go? They're going to go to the early childhood and our early childhood will probably be busting at the seams tonight and we need some workers to serve there. Even though we've got 250 to 300 workers every month that serve there's still more. And so you might be thinking, you know, New Hope's a big church. There's plenty of people. Somebody else can do that. Don't think that way because there is always a need. And the reality is there's so much more joy in serving and giving than just receiving. And so I encourage you, find that place wherever it is that you can serve. And you don't have to be gifted at being a nursery worker. You just get a hold of baby. It's amazing. I do that, my wife and I, every Sunday night, one Sunday night a month. We love that. Can I encourage you to live selflessly? You will experience so much joy, joy that you didn't know was possible because it's truly much more blessed to give than to receive. Can I pray for you? Father, thank you so much for this message today, one that we've heard that we know. But God, I thank you for those today who responded for the first time, inviting you into their life to be their Lord and Savior, to follow you. May all of us who maybe have been following you for years, decades, have a renewed sense of the great love that you have, of the sacrifice, Jesus, that you willingly gave your life to die in my place response to you as I give you my life. I offer my life back to you as a way of just saying thanks. Thank you so much. For the 
hope that I have. It's not a hope so kind of hope, it's a no so. I know what you've done and I know what you've promised and I know where I'm going and I don't have to worry or fear or doubt. I just want to follow you. Bless your people.